and situated. But I have to clarify first, married 46 years. Gary <coughs> watches that video. 25 years he's a deacon, but we got married 46 years. Wow. <laughs> I'm getting jewels in heaven for that one. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I'd like you to pray with me the prayer to the Holy Spirit. Thank God for Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let's pray. O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. And I know we just said Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. But I would like to call on Our Lady of Pena uh, Francia. Francia, okay. Um, I'd like her to pray for us. And I came across her the other day. My sister and I do a rosary by FaceTime. She's in Phoenix, I'm in New York. And I told her I was going to Oakland to with the Filipino community. And she goes, oh, my parish, they have like this novena in it to the saint. And I, I, and I looked up, I said, oh, St. Lorenzo? I don't know, it starts with a P, St. P. So I, I, she goes to get her bulletin, and she's saying, yeah, it's Our Lady of, I said, stop, that's our Blessed Mother, that's one of her titles. And so um, I went online, and um, you, it says you can ask for her maternal protection and guidance of the Blessed Mother in our pursuit of attaining unity through dialogue. That's, I said, oh, she has to be here with us under that title. So, I'm sorry, Peña Francia. Okay. Pray for us and be with us. Okay, amen. I thank you so much for your invitation today to be with all of you. This leaders workshop in Oakland, California. I'm just so happy to be here and to share. Uh, the title of this presentation is Our Journey to the Charism. I know that each one of us here today has had an experience of living a Curcio weekend. And by that living experience, we share the same charism of the Curcio movement. So how has this affected your walk? Has the experience moved you to attend Altrea? Has it moved you to seek out a friendship group reunion? Altrea and group reunion are the pearl of great price in Curcio. In my journey and study, I discovered that Eduardo Bonin was the layman who received the original charism of our movement, and he devoted his whole life to living the charism, and he traveled five continents to spread the foundational charism of Curcio to Curciestas. The United States was part of his travels. One of them was in 1995 when he came to Denver, Colorado. I was there. It was my first national encounter, and Eduardo gave a keynote address entitled Keep Curcio simple. Hmm, what did he mean by that? Keep Curcio simple. He actually gave, um, uh, his presentation was taped because he gave the talk in English. It was broken English and sometimes he would go back into Spanish and come back. I do have a, a copy of his tape. Um, but he gave an analogy the Curcio is a tree, and told us that we are putting all these ornaments and decorations on the tree that you can no longer tell that there's a tree at all. I, I truly didn't know what that meant, but it, it stayed with me. The leaders in the USA 
were gradually deepening their relationship with Eduardo and his friends in Mallorca. So a couple years later, Eduardo spoke at a world encounter in Korea. This keynote address was entitled The Foundational Charism of Curcio. And he explained what the charism is and what it is not. And again, our US leaders were present. Later that year, the Vatican contacted Eduardo as founder of the Curcio movement and asked him to participate in a Vatican gathering of movements to be held the following year. Bishop Joseph Cordes interviewed him for the Vatican and his interview is called Signs of Hope. There are 10 founders that are in this book. And then the next year it happened. The Vatican held its very first World Congress of Movements in the Church and Eduardo was invited to speak about the Curcio. There were representatives from the U.S. there. At that time it was Tom and Vicki Sarge and Ken and Teresa Sittenauer. The Vatican Congress on Movements was extremely important. Finally, the Vatican was educating the movements and giving a definition to what a movement is and what its value is to the church. Movements are so important to the church that St. John Paul II said that movements are a providential response to our times. So in 2000, I was able to meet Eduardo again. This was a, a world altrea that was held in Rome. It was during the Jubilee year. St. Peter's Square was reserved only for Curciestas in the afternoon. So they actually es uh, escorted all the visitors out of St. Peter's Square, and then they had to come back in with a pass. A you had to have a Curcio pass to get back in. That's how much Curcio was valued by the Vatican. Um, that was quite a privilege to close down St. Peter's Square. I attended at the time because I was serving on the National Secretariat. I just went from a regional into the regional coordinator position. And so we had uh, seats at the top of the, the stairs. I don't know if you remember St. Peter's Square, but then there's these stairs that go up and there's a platform where the Pope is. And anyone that was there from the US National had a seat on the top of the stairs. Well, I can tell you, I'll never forget the day when John Paul II entered the arena. Hmm. Tears, tears. Everyone around was crying, tears of joy. His holiness was palpable. Um, I look around and my husband's crying. And I'm, everyone around, the security guard that's in the back is crying. It, it reminded me of when, when they came to arrest Jesus and everybody fell down by his, you know, his presence, his holiness. Um, I never experienced anything like that. It was so powerful. So at the end of this Altrea, the World Altrea, where Eduardo did speak, my husband and I were introduced to Eduardo again. I did bring some pictures, show and tell, so you can take a look at this table up here. The U.S. was searching and studying the charism of the movement. So by February 2003, our U.S. national staff traveled to Mallorca and spent a week with Eduardo. Now I know this because at that time, I was actually part of the national staff. Our English coordinator had resigned because of health, and so he asked me to step into that position for a year. I would have three regions. Victor Lugo stepped in, he would have three regions, and a gentleman from Michigan would have three, and Tom took uh, 11 and 12. You lucky people got Tom Sarge. <laughs> um, I did not go to Majorca, just the men went. 
So it was Tom Sarge, Victor Lugo, Jorge Barcelo, and Joachim Lee. Eduardo was very generous with his time. They met in his office. They were able to ask him as many questions as they wanted to. Uh, Tom videotaped some of the questions. And um, Eduardo's friend, Miguel Serrato, sat, sat next to him and sometimes because Eduardo sometimes would speak Mayorkin, and then the Spanish couldn't understand him either. So he was like kind of a translator for Spanish and English. But they got a lot of clarification about the Curcio movement. And when they returned, I met them for a meeting in Dallas, Texas, where they shared their discoveries with me. They were convinced and convicted that Eduardo was the founder. And they got answers to a lot of their questions and they recognized that there were adjustments that needed to be made to stay true to the foundational charism. Once you know the truth, you gotta share the truth. You can't hold on to it. So they reported their findings to our national secretariat that July. A unanimous decision was made to follow the foundational charism. And we have been moving forward ever since, praise God, since 2003, the U.S. National has been working toward what is the foundational charism and let's get closer to it. So now, in 2006, I was asked to serve on the World Curcio as Vice President. I remember thinking, I don't know anything about the world curcio. As a matter of fact, I, I prayed and thought, you know, Lord, should I should I take Spanish? You think I should, you know, make, take some classes on Spanish? And I'm in prayer, and I heard an audible voice inside of me say, your time is better spent in prayer. Oh, okay, I'm not taking Spanish. <laughs> so I flew to Los Angeles to be inducted, and I met for the first time Juan Ruiz. He was the president. And I met for the first time Marilyn, Maribel Gomez. She was the secretary, and she is my forever friend. Also was uh, Father David Smith, and I had worked with him a little bit when I was working in the National. Um, a dear, dear friend. I had the opportunity to go to Rome for the second World Congress of Ecclesial Movements. Um, the Vatican was embracing movements and Pope Benedict XVI had a great love for movements. He was carrying on what John Paul II started and he repeated the, the statement that John Paul said that movements are providential for our time. I had been praying about how Curcio serves the church. My husband's a deacon in the church. I was spending a lot of time in Curcio. Was it for fun? What, how did, I didn't see how Curcio fit in because I didn't know what a movement was and the charism, I didn't know any of that. So this gathering was done during Pentecost. Pope Benedict XVI comes in his Pope Mobile with this red cape with white around the collar and his white hair. He kind of looked like a Catholic Santa Claus. And um, it was just beautiful to see him come through. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. So at this event, there were 123 movements there. Uh, maybe the Focolari, Catholic Action, Knights of Columbus, Catholic Charismatic Renewal was there, Opus Dei, 123, not, not just Curcio, there were many, many there. And the dicastery at that time was called the Pontifical Council of the Laity. They handed out some books to the participants, Movements on the Church. I just happened to bring them with me. Movements in the church. This one was directed to the laity, 
telling them about the importance of the charism. And then the other one, ecclesial movements and the pastoral concern of the bishops. This was directed to the bishops so that they would receive the movements, receive them with love, Bishop um, Pope Benedict would say, do not squash the charism or the spirit. I love that. <laughs> the Vatican was teaching both the laity and the clergy on the importance of a movement and its charism. Wow, these books were an answer to my prayer. I have read them, I can't tell you how many times if you see my flags in yellow and highlighting, I ate them up because this was my answer on how Curcio serves the church. So I wanna share a little bit of my study with you. And I'm gonna start with, let's see who's first. Pope John Paul II. What is a movement? A movement is a concrete ecclesial reality with predominantly lay membership a journey of faith and a Christian witness which bases its own method on a precise charism given to the person of the founder in specific circumstances and ways. Pope John Paul II. Wow, that's what a movement is. Um, Also, because that was the first World Congress, the 1998 one, this is where they laid all the foundational work. That's why these books are so important. So in it, it also says what a charism is. And even Eduardo talks to us about what a charism is in his book, The History of a Charism. A charism is a gift from the Holy Spirit given to a person and given for the good of the whole church. And the charism is important because it is a movement's spiritual strength and its innovative character. The original charism gives life to a movement. And of course, because it's a gift from the Holy Spirit. Okay. So where do we go? to find the charism. This is uh, Bishop Rilko, he's now a cardinal. He was the president of the Pontifical Council of the Laity at the time. And he says, in communicating a movement's charism, its founder has an irreplaceable role. <coughs> he's telling all the movements to find, that want to find their charism, that we need to go to the founder. He says, because how does that even happen? He says, as the founder gradually discovers the various dimensions of the charism, he indicates the goals to be reached and defines methods and organizational structures. Hmm. And he says that the founder is the pivot of the life of every movement because he's the bearer of the original charism from which it was born and through which it lives. So wow, the founder is important. He indicates the goals, he defines the method, he defines organizational structures, but he goes one step further. From the founder's special position, brings his spiritual paternity and the authority that is unique of its kind that he exerts over the members. Wow, authority. The founder has a unique kind of authority. The, I love the word paternity because it's, it's like a fatherhood. He's like a father to us. It's so inviting. And the, the movements have a charism and have a founder. And then John Paul II tells us again why the movements are important. 
He says, the movements represent a powerful support, a moving and convincing reminder to live the Christian experience to the full with intelligence and creativity. So wow, this is not just the Curcio movement. This was all, every, every movement in the church. In order for a movement really to truly serve the church, we have to know our charism. We need to go to the founder for the methods and structures. We acknowledge his authority oh, because he's living the charism. That's why we go to him. He's a living the charism, and that's what we hunger to do. So now, do you have to be part of a movement to be Catholic? No, of course not. The Catholic has all kinds of um, ways to grow in your faith. Do you have to belong to a movement to be a Christian? No. But as John Paul II said, they are a powerful support to our Christian life, to live life to the full. So now I'm gonna move from the Vatican. Juan Ruiz had this wonderful idea. We were gonna leave Rome and fly to Majorca. We just heard about the founder at this Congress, and now we're going to meet Eduardo Bonin in Majorca. So in addition to myself, Juan, Maribel, and Father David, we were joined by Seth Agian, our English coordinator, and also Bishop Tamayo from Laredo, Texas. At the time, he was our Episcopal advisor. We met with Eduardo every day, a few times a day. We met in his office, we shared meals, we asked him questions. I knew that we were in the presence of a living saint. My spirit felt it. He was approachable, he was kind, smiling, upbeat, sincere, compassionate, he was full of joy. We went for a dinner at a friend's house. They had set up this long table. There must have been like um, 15 of us there. And everyone was speaking Spanish. Now, I don't know any Spanish. And they're talking and they're like, and I'm laughing. <laughs> like they told a joke, oh, it's funny. I don't know what they're saying. I just love being with them. It was just so joyful. So when the meal was over, Eduardo comes up to me. We're getting ready to leave. And in English, he said, my heart hurts for you because there was no English. And I said, oh, Eduardo, I'm just so happy to be here. I." You know, it, it, I'm just so happy. And then I told them, I said, thank you for the sacrifices you made for the Curcio movement. He said, no, no sacrifices. It was my joy. It was my joy. It is my joy. Oh, that was beautiful. Because he has had many sacrifices and, and persecutions um, throughout his life. So after my four-year service on the World Curcio, I served another four years in the International Curcio. It's called the NACG, the North America Caribbean Group. So I, as I've been sharing this journey about the Vatican, about um, Eduardo being in Mallorca, and now I'm with these other leaders that are from the Caribbean, and so I knew I needed to share this information with them. I knew I wasn't there for me. I was there for everyone. So when I had this gathering, uh, I had an encounter in Canada, and I put together some of the talks that were in the books that I heard from the Pope, from some of the Cardinals. I put it in a, in a book, and I put three of Eduardo's presentations that he gave over the years, the Science of Hope, um, the Foundational Charism, and Evangelization Through Conversion. Those were the three. So I gave each person that came to this NACG gathering this book, and I had asked Pope Benedict 
for an apostolic blessing, which I didn't get. And his picture is on the back of the book. Like, look at, he's blessing us. So in addition to letting the leaders who came, because they were from Cuba, St. Lucia, um, Trinidad, Tobago, Canada, of course, the US, of course, and there was uh, St. Vincent. Our Caribbean Kersiestas are so beautiful. And they were hunger, hungry for more also. But I knew that I had to keep going. I had to share what I'm learning. Because everywhere I would go, everything's in Spanish. I would say, Juan, we don't have this in English. And he'd refer to something. I'm like, but we don't have that in English. So Eduardo had passed away in February, February 6, 2008. And after he passed, Juan was still serving in the OMCC, but he felt this desire to start putting, talking about the charism. And we had this monthly newsletter that he would put out. So he'd start writing on the charism, him and um, Father David Smith. And um, I, after the, our term, I said, you know, who reads a newsletter? <laughs> Who's going to know what these newsletters contain? I got to give permission to put, especially they would skip a month and then, you know, sometimes it's just fluff that's in those newsletters. So I asked for permission, can I print these? Because if I put them together in a book, then it'll have value. So some of you may have seen this book. It's called Study of the Carousel. I don't author anything. I just put it together. So this contains the newsletter articles that Juan and Father David Smith were writing to inform us of the charism. And he was using Eduardo's um, information as he was writing it. This picture on the front with Juan and Eduardo, I was sitting across the table. And this picture in the back, I'm there. <laughs> Me, Maribel, Father David, Seth, Eduardo, Bishop Tamayo, and Juan Ruiz. And we're standing in front of a building, a uh, house called Medi Pines. They named their houses. But it's the first house in 1944. It's the first Curcio was held. It was on Calafigura, which is like an inlet. That's where you hear the conversations of Cal Figura. It's referring to this foundational, very first Curcio. So I put them together. This was my first book, so to speak, to share with the English so they had something to read. So I have truly made it a commitment. God has put this desire within me to continue to share his writings in English. I felt like I was the only one that was screaming, we don't have this in English. So, um, I lost my place. Hold on. <laughs> okay. I started with another book because Eduardo gave presentations when he traveled, and some of them were being translated, but they were in a PDF form, which, you know, how do you get that out to people? I would send it to people, I would I talk to people, I would, you know, send them, have you read this, have you read that? But there was no place to go to get everything. Since I had this relationship with Majorca, um, I got to be friends with Miguel Serrata, which was one of Eduardo's dear friends. And again, I asked him permission. I, I pleaded, Eduardo, uh, uh, Miguel, we don't have these things in English. Can I put them together in a book? And he said, you know, in Mallorca, we're thinking about doing that. We're going to put a book about Eduardo's thoughts and his thinking. And I said, well, we need it now. Can I do it now? He gave me permission. And so 
I went through looking for every single presentation I could find that was already in English, and I put them together in this, the thinking of Eduardo Boni. I had to go through FAVA though, because they, they started where they want the English and Spanish to be the same. So they did the cover, and they don't have the Spanish yet. <laughs> but we have it in English first. Um, and in here are all these presentations. The one that I talked about that he gave in Rome in 1998, it's here. When he talked to the World Altrea, here. When he went to, <coughs> He went to um, Korea for the World Encounter on the Foundation of Charism here. Uh, the Signs of Hope, that interview with uh, Bishop Joseph Cordes here. And there was one of my favorite ones that's in here is, it's called Evangelization Through Conversion. And it's a talk that he gave in Canada. Um, and I love that because he explains how as long as we're on a continual conversion, we are going to evangelize. So Curcio is unique. Our continual conversion is how we evangelize. So anyway, that I was so excited to get um, permission to do that. Okay, everything happens in God's time. So, when all this was done, Seth Agian approached me and Maribel, and he said, you know, you guys have had a lot of experiences. I would like to know if you would work on the U.S. Rector's Guide. The Spanish and English aren't the same. So could you go through and, you know, make them the same? Okay, Mirabelle and I said, yeah, we'll do it. She, Mirabelle is my friend in crime here because I don't speak Spanish. So I kind of just put things through a translator with the Spanish on one side, English on the other. Then I send it to her so she looks at it. And then I get it back and I read it again because I have to read every word and it has to make sense. So if it doesn't, then you know we go back and forth. That's how I translate. So we decided that we would do this. We would match the English and the Spanish rector guides. So we had some questions as we're going along. So we're contacting, um, we're contacting Mallorca for answers. We're calling Miguel, we, I don't know how many emails I have with him. And we discover that Mallorca is working on this rector's guide that Eduardo left as part of his spiritual testament. Now, um, in this book, My Spiritual Testament, there's a reference that there's more coming. So Eduardo was leaving us this legacy, and he said that there are appendices that are coming. And this rector guide was one of the appendices. There's gonna be one on post curcio and one on pre curcio but in Mallorca time, who knows how long that takes. But anyway, we discovered that they're, they're working on this rector guide. They're translating it, putting it together. We're like, why are we working on this English-Spanish thing? Because when, when the, the Mallorca comes out, we're gonna like change it anyway. So we had to put together a presentation, November 2016. We had to go to the National Secretariat and kind of plead our case, can we follow and adapt this uh, rector's guide that my ark is putting together, which is part of my spiritual testament? And they said yes. Okay, the National Secretariat's on this journey. So it started, and I know you're familiar with it, Everyone's talking about it. Um, the Rector's Guide. It has things that we haven't seen before. There's 16 appendices. And the, the last appendix is, this is the way. 
by Eduardo Bonin. He leaves us a letter. I told Maribel, you can put it as number 16 appendices, but we're putting it in the front of the book. Somebody might not get to the number 16 appendix, uh, appendix, I'm sorry. So it's in two places. It's in the front of the book, and it's in appendix 16. Because, you know, Mallorca is so used to Eduardo that they, you know, they don't, he's just one of them. He's a part of them. To us, we who have not been around him all the time, it means more. So here's this letter, and he's saying that this is the way. Now, I know as we're going through this and questioning some things, I remember when we were introducing games, and I think in Mallorca they had soccer, because they do soccer, and they had just some odd games that we don't have, and everyone was questioning, why? what do they mean by games? How do games fit in? And when I was reading the Diary of St. Faustina, I came across one of the notes that, and she says that the sisters gather 30 minutes twice a day for recreation, because that's how you get to know each other. Hmm, games, not a bad idea. Because what we're trying to build on the weekend is friendship. That's why there's games. Hmm, St. Faustina's in on helping us understand. There's stories here, um, the bankruptcy stories. Again, do we understand them? I asked Mallorca and they said that they want, Eduardo wanted something that was out abstract so that it wouldn't be real personal. You'd hear it, but you might be able to relate to it. So one is on power, one is on vanity, um, one is on finances, money. And so when you're hearing that, this person who has all this money, I mean, he knows he's dying, you think he's gonna call on God, and he's putting down how much money he got. <laughs> it's to make you think, and if it's not for you alone, maybe you know someone, maybe your dad was like that, or someone you know. That's why those stories are in there. Um, let me think of another one. The story of John it comes in on Saturday. John's coming into the church, walks up to the Blessed Sacrament, you know, kneels down, and then leaves. And the priest was wondering, what's this guy doing coming in at lunchtime every day? So when he's sick in the hospital, the priest goes to visit them. I'm just giving you a synopsis. The priest goes to visit him. The nurse is like, oh, he's all alone. Nobody comes to see him. And he's in the bed and said, oh, no, every day, at 12 o'clock, I have a visitor. Jesus sits on my bed and says, hello, John. Jesus is here. You know, when you're on the weekend with all that grace, it has such an impact. And so then you're introducing, we're going to the Blessed Sacrament. Jesus is present there. And we go to the tabernacle because we're gonna speak out loud to Jesus. We don't wanna to go to a monstrance. We have people who are far away coming. We don't wanna scare them. We go to the tabernacle and we speak out loud. We go by tables and we invite them to come individually by themselves. So there's a lot of new things that are in the rector guide, but there's a reason for, for each one of them. And we're discovering them a little at a time. You know, this, the, the, the other thing we realize is that we, we don't want to really give biographies because once you start telling the role you play, you're married, single, whatever, or um, the education you have or don't have, it kind of, you're kind of putting yourself like in a slot, and we want to be one. We're on a journey together. It doesn't matter what role you are. We're on a journey to Christ together. So that was another thing we kind of gleaned from that. 
We're discovering the what is important, those topics that we heard from the first conversations, normality. When you walk in the church, what do you see? A tabernacle. And you don't really see a monstrance unless it's a special adoration time. Friendship, joy, conviction, life, the person, freedom, the entire conversion process. We want our candidates to discover that God loves them. And in order for that to happen, we have to set a climate, the team sets a climate for friendship and for freedom. Uh, in this spiritual testament, Eduardo tells the story um, when he was in the military and the, one of his army mates comes in from the brothel and he's all bragging and laughing and, and Eduardo asks him, are you happy? <laughs> yeah. Eduardo asks him again, are you happy? I mean, he's asking him sincerely, are you happy? No, no, I can't. he's not happy. He's living this false life. And so Eduardo was wondering, is it the law that keeps people? Or is it um, the doctrine, not knowing the doctrine? And he discovered that they didn't know the doctrine of the faith. And so uh, what Eduardo is doing he would read a lot of well-known Catholic authors at the time, talking about, or that would write about being a Christian. What, what makes someone a Christian? What do you need? What is fundamental for being a Christian? And in his How and the Why, he quotes uh, one of his authors, and he says that that it's necessary to dismantle what was learned and rebuild it piece by piece, connecting it to a person's reality, their circumstances, their longings, their lived existence, and then build it back with those answers to our questions. So in other words, you have to start by knowing yourself. We can't have a faith from our first Holy Communion. And then when you know yourself, you can ask questions, seek answers, and you can add back piece by piece your life, your experiences, your circumstances, based on all that, your questions will be answered. Not what someone told you, what you discovered for yourself. Because you rebuild your faith and you own it. And you know what that, that produces? Conviction. It produces conviction. So I, I want to emphasize that there is a conversion that is going on in the Curcio weekend. And an encounter with self is critical. Being cloistered is critical to this method. The team creating an atmosphere of friendship is critical. Allowing the candidates freedom to think, to ponder, to share with others is critical. And personal contact from the team is the technique that's used throughout the three days. Now, the personal contact, why is that so important? And Eduardo says that in, in a rector's guide, there's um, a page that says that they have the thing that's bothering them. So when you're talking with someone in the personal context, sometimes that thing comes out, like they're angry at God, they don't think they're worthy. Something's bothering them that's keeping them from 
opening up to the grace. So their personal contact is important. And then when the new Perseastas live their fourth day, they need to know that Perseo is still alive, that it's being lived. And that happens at our Altraeus and at the closing. So we, the Perseastas, who've lived the three days, we have the great gift of living this movement's charism every day. And it is the essence of Perseo, Christ, the person, and friendship. Friendship is sharing our life with others. Friendship is a human act of love. There's love in friendship. Caring for another, taking time to know one another, journeying with one another. Their sorrow is our sour, sorrow. Their joy is our joy. And it's a great gift. The gospel tells us that Jesus called us friends. It it's, helps us to live in grace. I want to tell you a little bit about my group reunion. I've been in a friendship group reunion for 30 years. And I, when, I, when Curcio touched my heart, I wanted to live it fully. And then if it didn't work, then I was out of there. But I was going to put 100% in. So as I asked each girl, that joined me, there were four of us, that includes me, there were three others. I said, I wanna do this friendship group, Brian, but I want to group every week. So are you willing to make the commitment? And they said, yes. And so every week for 30 years, I have grouped with these girls. We share our piety study in action we meet, a lot of times we would meet at my house. I just put on coffee or tea. It, it only takes an hour. I mean, you don't have to spend a lot of time. My one friend, seven children, and when we started grouping, she was pregnant. So all I have to do is think about how old Veronica is, and I know how long we've been grouping. Um, but when we would get together and share, and she'd share her piety, and she would tell me, that she did, you know, I did the rosary, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, I don't have seven kids. How does she do, have time to do the rosary? It inspired me. I admired her faith walk, and it inspired me to do the rosary. If she can do it with seven kids, I can do it. That's what the group reunion does. It's such a gift. You group women with women and men with men. So my husband, he has a group reunion. There's a couple of the husbands that I'm grouping with the wives. Well, why is that? When we're on a Perseo weekend, it's a woman's weekend. The men are on a men's weekend. So in order to continue living the Perseo, you're continuing the Perseo weekend. Women with women, men with men. If I have a man, in, a man in my group, I'm not gonna share the same way. If, a, if I'm in a group with a man, he's not gonna be honest. Is he having a problem with an addiction? He's not gonna tell me. Uh, it, but when you are with women, we can be honest and truthful. My husband driving me crazy. No. <laughs> It's, it's so important that we stick to that and that you, you have this group reunion of friends that know you and you know them. And then we have Altrea, and we still would go to Altrea because then you're meeting with other people that, um, that are sharing their life. And friendship, I, I think Eduardo would call it a festival of friends. So when I went to uh, Majorca, they had a sign on their Altrea. I, I made this for you. It says, welcome to the Altrea. You are at the point of conversions of the restlessness of many. Your presence among us increases our joy. Open yourselves to the awe of the unheard possibilities of the gospel. 
de colores. So what, what do they need of the gospel? You and I are the living gospel. We're trying to live the gospel which Jesus gave us. So Altrea is key. And there's more. Because there's miracles that happen when you're sharing like that. Have you ever answered that question? What was your moment most aware of Christ? Think about that. There are many moments Christ is in your life and present. Some of those are miracles. You know, Eduardo used to talk that we don't recognize as miracles because they're small, they're tiny, they're mis minuscule, but they are moments when Christ is in your life. Now, when I moved from Niagara Falls to Webster, New York, about three years ago, and you know the move, what was, Gary and I were kind of going through our heads, we didn't want to leave our group reunion. You have friends like that, oh my goodness. We weren't thinking about, you know, a house or whatever. We're really on the table was our group reunion friends. So anyway, I moved to Webster. I'm about six miles from my son. And in the middle of us is a Cursiesta, someone that I had met in Chicago at a National Encounter 2016. And then we went on a pilgrimage together. And some of you may know her, Bobby Lavoy, because she served on the National Secretariat. And she invited me to join her group reunion. Now, that's not a coincidence. That is a God incident. God had planned that so I could continue group reunion. And so, and my group friends that I have from Buffalo, we're still together when I get back. Um, my group sister and Gary's group brother, their husband and wife, they're coming on Friday for dinner. I mean, we still keep in touch. It's just friends and friends and friends. But we share Christ together. We don't just talk about football and baseball and whatever, what we're cooking. <laughs> okay. Eduardo was a psychologist, and he tells us in the structure of ideas about the absolute of man and the absolute of God. The absolute of man or person is that a person wants to be loved and a person wants to love. The absolute of God is that God is love and God loves us. God fulfills man's desire for love. There's a hole in a person, and it's empty until they know that they are loved. And a person finds this joy, love, and peace when they invite God into their life. The Curcio weekend is carefully laid out for a person to take down and reconstruct their faith, beginning with themselves, an encounter with self, and then adding on the discovery that God loves them. And to keep that faith journey, to guarantee it, there's a total security royal. The last royal on the weekend, sometimes it's referred to as group reunion and ultrea. This is total insurance that if you make a commitment to the group reunion and ultrea, you can make this journey to the Father in the company of friends. Um, I do want to mention quickly, uh, in this thinking of Eduardo Boni book, there's a section that he writes on secretariats. And he gives us the definition of Curcio, and I'm sure you've heard it before. Curcios in Christianity are the best news that God in Christ loves us communicated by the best method, which is friendship, towards the best of everyone, which is their very being as a person, and their capacity for conviction, for decision, and for constancy. 
And then in that same article, he talks about the secretariats and what they do. They are to be the guardians of the purity of the method. They're there to safeguard the essence of Curcio. So we need to guard and protect to learn and discover this wonderful charism that Curcio is. I'd like to end with another quote from the Vatican because they talked about a founder and what happens when he's no longer with us. It confirms his intercession with us. And this is the quote. The person who receives this grace of the original charism communicates it during his mortal life. And once he's entered into the glorious communion of saints, he continues to act with this powerful intercession. I personally believe that Eduardo Bonin's servant of God is interceding for us in heaven. And that is why we have this new study and this new rector guide. It's really an exciting time. We can each personally pray for him. The Vatican gave us a prayer and a title, that title of servant of God. That's something that I know I continually do. Thank you for your time. I want to end with a prayer of thanksgiving. We give you thanks, almighty God, for all the benefits you have given us, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. De Colores. De Colores.